what's going on here? Then he looks back at the dog, and to his surprise, the dog turns around and says, <laughs> Hello, Survivors, and welcome to Survivor's Guild, the only channel that determines your odds of surviving 2002's Werewolf War Games movie, Dog Soldiers. So stay tuned till the end for your survival stats. I'm your sharp-dressed slasher turned my training didn't include this, Ghost Fake. Now before we begin, go ahead and hit that like button to knock it out so you can super glue its guts back into its body. Hey, me! <laughs> and go ahead and interrogate that subscribe button because it's acting awful suspicious. And make sure to hit that share button to get the story out before it ends up in the tabloids. <laughs> ah, damn it, too late. Now I hope you like that all dogs definitely don't go to heaven, cause this movie is getting spoiled. Dog Soldiers, written and directed by Neil Marshall and starring Kevin McKidd, Liam Cunningham, Emma Cleesby, Sean Pertwee, and Darren Morfitt. Dog Soldiers is about a ragtag squad of British soldiers on a trading exercise that pits them against a very real foe. That that they very weren't prepared for. We open up to well-known hotbed for cryptid activity, Scotland. If you can think of one good thing that has ever come out of Scotland, let me know in the comments below. And these two campers, we'll call them dude and lady, who are out camping to celebrate his new job as a professional writer, I think, and she gifts him a sterling silver letter opener. No knight should be without his sword. I don't know what to say the one tool every writer needs. Later that night, while he unzips her pants, something unzips their tent. and grabs Lady, ripping into her before Dude could at deposit number one into the meat bank. Before off-screen ripping Dude into the meat bank at deposit number two. Cut to two hours earlier and this soldier, we'll call him Cooper, who was trying out for a spot on a special forces unit, and once he's finally cornered, he puts up one hell of a fight. <laughs> before finally taking the L. You evaded capture for 22 hours. Which is actually a W. Go straight to the head of the class. When we get introduced to Captain Richard Ryan, who is the leader of the Special Forces Unit, who is impressed with Cooper's performance. But when Captain Ryan challenges Cooper to kill the celebratory dog, yeah. shoot the dog. Cooper refuses to kill the dog without a reason. Shoot it! No, sir! I just will not kill that dog for no reason. Causing the captain to fail him, telling him that he needs men of action, not of conscience. Captain Ryan walks over and kills the dog himself, like a true leader, and tells Cooper there is no sense in crying over spilt dog. Cooper tries to avenge the dog, but Captain Ryan overpowers him, threatening him that he doesn't give second chances, and that he never forgets. Cut to four weeks later in the highlands of Scotland, and a squad that is getting dropped off by a helicopter. We get introduced to Sergeant Wells, Spoon, Terry, Bruce, and Joe, and we find out that this squad is on a training exercise, and that none of them are too excited to be there. That's just an exercise. Hardly life or death. But we also find out that Sergeant Wells sympathizes with Cooper for not getting on special forces, but says that their squad would be in much worse shape if he wasn't in it. The group start hiking through the countryside, and sometime later they stop for a break, and Cooper tells them a story about a camping couple that went missing. Just last month, a young couple were hiking through these woods. They set up camp somewhere near here. And how it happens pretty often in these parts. Later that evening, the squad set up camp and begin sharing stories about what scares them the most. And Sergeant Wells shares a story about a friend of his named Eddie, a member of his old unit, who accidentally tripped an anti-tank mine and was evaporated. Oh, triggered an anti-tank mine. Eddie, and he was gone tall tailing Eddie into the meat bank at deposit number three. And after Sergeant Wells wraps up his story, the squad continue on when they get jump scout by a dead cow that falls into their camp. But when Cooper investigates the calcus, he notices that the wounds on the beast look more like teeth marks, and the group sets up watch while some of them get some sleep. The next day, the squad investigate the small cliff that the cow kamikaze from, and Sergeant Wells decides to follow the blood trail to see where the cow came from. And sometime later, they come across some blood and organs spread among the foliage. But when investigating the entrails, they see a flare shot into the air and decide to head in that direction to investigate the source. They arrive at the special forces camp, which is covered with blood and viscera. What the f hell happened here, Sarge? And Sergeant Wells tells the squad that now they are up against a real threat. We are now up against live hostile targets. And that they need to load up with whatever real weapons and ammo they can find, since the ones that they were carrying were loaded with blanks. And as the men load up, Captain Ryan appears from behind some of the crates, gravely injured, and Cooper and Sergeant Wells bandage up the captain while Bruce tries to call in an evac. As they bandage up Ryan, who keeps repeating, there was only supposed to be one. It was only supposed to be one. Like a damn Highlander or something, Cooper starts pointing out peculiarities of the camp, suggesting that this must have been a spec ops mission rather than part of their training 
exercise, taking note of the guns and tranquilizers. Captain Ryan tells them that whatever it was that attacked them, it ripped his men apart. Tore them to pieces this in front of my eyes! Choke. And after the squad loads up, they begin hearing screams coming from the woods and decide that it's time to head away from the camp. The group head deeper into the woods and Bruce loses them, eventually being cornered by something, armed with a gun that's jammed. He runs away from it, only to run into a tree branch, kebobbing himself into the meat bank at deposit number four. Sergeant Wells goes looking for him, only to get attacked by one of the beasts, who slashes him across the stomach, disemboweling him. But Cooper arrives and scares off the monster with a few rounds. He runs over to Sergeant Wells and lets him know that there is no sense crying over spilled guts, and Cooper attempts to re-embowel the sergeant. They're not gonna and later they reunite with the squad. As night falls, the squad continue through the woods, fending off the werewolves chasing them, before they come to a road that happens to have a vehicle driving on it. Get in! Uh, everybody on me! The driver tells them all to get in, and the squad loads into the vehicle and tears down the road. During the drive, we get introduced to Megan, who says that the night prior she heard gunfire and knew that someone was out there, and that they're lucky she found them. And she says that she'll take them to a farm nearby as the owners happen to be friends of hers, and that from there they can tend to their wounded and call for help. They arrive at the farm, and Cooper heads into the house to investigate, finding the house recently vacated, being that there is dinner on the table and water boiling on the stove. Yet no one is anywhere to be found, aside from their dog, Sam. They load everyone into the house and begin bandaging up the sergeant. Cooper asks Megan where the nearest town is and decides that instead of staying at the suspicious house, he'd rather try for the town if she can take them there. But when they go to get into the Land Rover, they find that it's been ripped to pieces, and even worse is that the werewolves have surrounded the house. Go on. <laughs> waiting for their opportunity to attack. They run back into the house, tossing the flare which blows up the vehicle. That puts a kibosh on that plan. Cooper sends Joe and Spoon to secure the perimeter, while Terry goes and fills pots with water to get them boiling, since they have very limited ammo. Cooper takes Sergeant Wells upstairs so that he can better bandage him up, while the rest of the squad look for anything they can use to defend themselves. Back with Cooper, Wells, and Megan. Hey, me! <laughs> Wells tells Cooper to knock him out before they sew him up. Oh, yeah. Hey, me! <laughs> And Megan goes on to tell Cooper that she's lived in the area for around two years, and that she's a zoologist that moved to the area precisely for the wildlife. She tells him that she's heard all of the stories, and that now she believes all of them. And after they finish, Cooper takes her downstairs to share her findings with the squad, telling them that they are facing off against werewolves, which are different than lycanthropes. Until now, I thought that that was just another name for werewolves, but it's not. It turns out that lycanthropes aren't limited to the phases of the moon, and can transform at will, basically. So, you learn something new every day, I guess. She goes on to confuse lycanthropes with werewolves. The full moon, the teeth, the claws, the howling. Some zoologist you are. And she tells them that she's been tracking the beasts for the last year, monitoring their every move, and that every month when the moon is full, they hunt as a team dedicated to the kill. And that over that time, 15 people have been killed, which means, minus our couple from the beginning, we get 13 more meat bank deposits. During that time, at least 15 people have vanished accounting for deposits 5 through 17, and that she doesn't know how to kill them, but that no one has tried silver yet. Also mentioning that she's never actually seen the kill, absolving her from being an accessory to murder. So that's cool. Spoon buys it all immediately, hook, line, and sinker, but Cooper still has some questions, such as how does Ryan fit into all of this, reminding us that his whole squad was ripped apart the night prior, which will count now. Assuming that the squad that he was deployed with was the same size as it was when Cooper tried out, we are going to count in four more meat bank deposits, taking us from 18 to 21. And while Ryan defends himself, Cooper notices a picture of the Uoths. The Uoths. The family that owns the house, which will come back later. As earlier when we saw a picture of them, there were only four, and now in this picture there's five. But Cooper starts questioning Ryan again, mentioning that when they found him, he was nearly dead, and now he seems to be just fine. They ask to see his injury, and he fights them. He won't mind if I have a look at that wound of yours. I just assume you didn't. 
but when they subdue him and look for themselves, he is virtually all healed, having now only a scar where his gaping wound would be. So they decide that it's better to tie him up. And while they discuss how best to extract information from him, whether through the power of kindness or the power of torture, the power goes out, meaning that the werewolves knocked out the generator, and the squad realizes that there is an attack incoming. Why would they do that? Because they can see in the dark. And you're afraid of it. And boy does it. As the werewolves begin attacking different areas of the house, the squad fends them off with rounds and boiling water. <laughs> turning these werewolves into swearwolves. And they nearly yanked Joe out of the window. Cheers, mate. In the heat of battle, Cooper remembers that Sergeant Wells is upstairs, incapacitated, and he runs up to check on him, only to find a wolf edging closer to his bed, and another attacking him from the other side. So Cooper grabs the only weapon he can find, a camera that's laying on the ground, and he uses the flash and the threat of exposure, <laughs> that's a photography part, to cause the wolves to retreat before he can grab his gun and, along with Sergeant Wells, unload on the intruders. And for a brief moment, things quiet down. Dogs. More like p but unfortunately, Terry speaks too soon and gets pulled out of the window. Later, the group lick their wounds and mourn their dead, but also start reinforcing their fortress, and Megan mentions that their only hope is daybreak, which is in about six hours. While Cooper bandages up Megan, he finds out that her and Captain Ryan know each other from Ryan's team's first visit to the area. I was seconded to his team during their first visit here and that his team was sent to check out the stories that were going around. The group mulls over some of their options, like staying and dying or leaving and dying, and Megan mentions that there is a car in the barn and that they may be able to hotwire it if they can get to it. They opt for Spoon to act as a decoy while Joe runs to the vehicle, and as the wolves take the bait, Joe hightails it to the barn. Spoon makes it back to the house, and Joe makes it all the way to the Land Rover in the barn. And when he hotwires the vehicle, the lights turn on and reveal what's happening to Terry. Aw, oh, just die already, would you? And the werewolf bites into Terry's neck and chucks his severed head at the Land Rover. What an asshole. Chucking Terry into the meat bank at deposit number 22. Joe then backs his way out of the barn and pulls up to the house, while the others prepare to vacate the premises. But while Joe waits, he realizes that he's not alone. You're behind me, aren't you? and jumps into the back to kick out the stowaway. But instead, he jumps into the meat bank at deposit number 23. The others rush to enter the vehicle, only to find that it's overflowing with Joe. Oh, gross. We'll wait for the next one. And they quickly fire at the wolf and close the door. Sometime later, the group is able to investigate the vehicle and come to the conclusion that the car's not going anywhere unless they can repair it, realizing that their odds aren't great. Maybe one or two of us are gonna make it through this. I don't care much for our chances. They try interrogating Ryan again. Ryan decides to just come clean, and he tells them about the Special Weapons Division and how his team was hired by them to catch what they thought was a lone werewolf so that they could weaponize it. Uh, there go us human again, always trying to weaponize things like climate change. But what they thought was one was several, and they were outwolfed, and his team was killed. And to make matters worse, Sergeant Wells' team was bait to bring out the beast. You're expendable, and I had approval to put you at risk. I guess humans are the real monsters after all. Well, uh, us and sharks. But when the interrogation gets violent, Ryan doesn't liken it and decides to bounce. And a short time later, Cooper starts putting together that the family that lives in this house are indeed the werewolves that are trying to get them out of it. Werewolves spend most of their time in human form, right? And the only people for miles around live right here. Megan hypothesizes that if the werewolves act like mirror wolves, they are probably hunkered down in the barn, and the group begins planning a final attack on the wolves. Spoon and Cooper get nervous about how well Sarge is healing up, and Cooper stops to talk with him. Sarge tells Cooper that he's worried that Megan is wrong and asks what happens if not all the wolves are in the barn, and Cooper voices that he'd rather get some of them than none of them. Sergeant Wells offers himself up as tribute. I hold him back. I keep him occupied and you get out showing Cooper that he's pretty well healed up, and that it's only a matter of time before he ends up like Ryan. But Cooper is determined to follow Sarge until he just can't anymore, so the group continues turning the Land Rover into a roving explosive. They send the vehicle barreling towards the barn, leaving a trail of gasoline to ignite it. Light it! They blow the barn to hell where it came from, and before they can celebrate, Megan apologizes for the bad intel. And there were no werewolves in the barn when it blew? Not one coming clean that there were no wolves in the barn. And while she's confessing to the lies that she's telling, Sergeant Wells is, and I'm assuming here, taking some silver and packing it into the gun with a bullet. Anyway. They were always here. I just unlocked the door. Megan reveals that she let the wolves in before starting to change herself. 
But before she can transform completely, Sergeant Wells sends that bullet through her cranium, head traumaing Megan into the meat bank at deposit number 24. The wolves then force Wells and Coop up the stairs, while Spoon gets cut off by one of the wolves and sent scrambling to the kitchen, where he realizes that he's out of ammo. The wolf breaks through the door and Spoon defends himself the only way he knows how, with his fists and then with a knife, before he becomes a swearwolf himself. But this dog is immune to stabbing and tosses him across the room. Just then, Spoon starts tossing everything at the wolf but the kitchen sink, and when he gets the upper hand, a second wolf enters the kitchen and off-screen deposits Spoon into the meat bank at deposit number 25. I hope I give you the shit, you f***ing wimp. Originally, Spoon was going to have an absolutely brutal and gory on-screen death, but the director, Neil Marshall, felt that it would be unfair to the audience to kill him in such a way, which is fascinating. Meanwhile upstairs, Sarge and Coop find themselves in two separate rooms, fending off the furries. Until Coop can cut through the drywall to get to Wells, and then cut through more drywall to get to the next room. Man. Coop is a drywall cutting machine. The two of them climb into a wardrobe to hide and find a pile of bones at the bottom. Which is why you never buy a wardrobe at Goodwill, Goodwilling this pile of bones into the meat bank at deposit number 26. Sergeant Wells shoots through the floor and the two of them drop down to the ground level when they find that Spoon is no more. But with no time to cry over spilt Spoon, they devise a plan. Sergeant Wells forces Cooper into the cellar while he stays behind, giving Coop his pistol with the one last round that they have, he himself beginning the transformation into a werewolf. He then cuts the gas line and waits for the wolf family to enter the kitchen. He then ignites the stove, obliterating the house, himself, and the Uoth family of wolves, landing Sergeant Wells into the meat bank at deposit number 27, and the Uoths at deposit number 28 through 31. Coop hangs out for a little bit before he begins looking for a way out, but as he's stumbling around, he bumps into a couple of dead bodies hanging in the cellar, which I'm not going to count because I'm pretty sure that they're either some of the already counted hikers or Ryan's team. Speaking of Ryan, he shows back up in full wolf form. Ryan, you tried licking your own balls yet? and begins trying to finish what he started with Coop. But when Sam the dog distracts Ryan, Coop finds that letter opener from the hikers at the beginning of the movie, and he uses it to weaken Ryan Wolf by stabbing him with it, before he grabs his pistol and puts this dog to sleep. I think it's all over. It is now. Proving that all dogs don't go to heaven, sending Ryan straight to hell at deposit number 32. Coop eventually emerges from the debris of the doghouse, and we get a final reveal that Cooper's story ends up in a tabloid, and the movie ends. So now, to find out, what are your chances of suffering survivor's guilt? This is where we take a look at our main characters and the death that surrounds them to determine your odds of surviving this movie. Tell me, honestly, what are our chances? Well, I'm glad you asked, Megan. We start off our meat bank deposits with these two hikers becoming wolf bait at deposits one and two, followed by Eddie tall tailing into the meat bank at deposit number three. Bruce kebabs in at deposit number four, and all of the missing campers and hikers become dog meat at deposits five through 17, followed by Ryan squad at 18 through 21. Terry gets chucked in at deposit number 22, followed by Joe devaluing Miss Land Rover at deposit number 23. Megan man's best friends in at deposit number 24, followed by Spoon spilling in at deposit number 25. This pile of bones thrift stores in at deposit number 26, while Sergeant Wells transforms into deposit number 27, but not before he puts all dogs go to heaven to the ultimate test by depositing the Uoth family at deposits 28 through 31. And we wrap up our meat bank deposits with Ryan, giving Cooper a solid reason to kill a dog at deposit number 32 into our meat bank. Now let's take a look at our survivors. Maybe one or two of us are going to make it through this. I don't care much for our chances. We've got Cooper, which means that out of a total of 33 characters, only one survives, giving you a 3.03% chance of surviving this movie. Given those odds, who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Let me know in the comments below. And if this is your first time on my channel, go ahead and subscribe so that you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Also, just as an update to the Patreon stuff, turns out that I can't get rid of a tier if people are still part of it. So that's kind of funny. But I did go ahead and change the tier so that the ghost fake mask isn't part of it, though I do have a few left. I'm just not sure how I'm going to give those out yet. And if you haven't got yours yet, it's because I don't have your address, so please send it to me if you would. And a huge thanks to all my patrons. I seriously appreciate your support. Alrighty, guys. As always, thanks and don't die. Dogs. More like p****s.